Lingua Britannica is a podcast that uses ethnographic interviews to study language use in the extreme metal community. We are studying a music scene known for its love of themes and topics generally considered offensive, and it is likely that some episodes will touch on topics or opinions some listeners may find tasteless or ethically problematic. Ethnographic researchers aim to adopt the interviewee's point of view so that we can draw out and study the attitudes, beliefs, and practices that are important to them. We want to make it clear that in presenting these conversations here, we do not endorse any of their content. Our aim is to explore the thought processes behind language use in this long-running, international and yet understudied scene. Hey everyone, welcome back to Lingua Britannica with me, Jess Benny smith and my co-host Wes Robertson. Hello. Uh, today we're lucky to be joined by Kat Cheval gillam uh, who is the drummer and vocalist of numerous bands, including Nine Altars, Enshroudment, Lucifer's Chalice, Uncoffined, uh, Winds of Genocide, and of course Thronehammer, whose lyrics we'll be focusing on in our interview today. Uh, so how are you, Kat? I'm fine, thank you. Um, it's quite warm here, so I'm um, that um, <laughs> start sweating in this in the sun at the moment I should probably move where I'm sitting but um, I'm getting right in the sun (laughs) so (laughs) lovely yeah I'm jealous it's a bit cold here in Melbourne so yeah we'll start off as we always do if you wouldn't mind could you describe Thronehammer's music uh, for someone who's never heard of Thronehammer before I would basically describe it as um, a heavy you know crushing mix of epic doom metal um, Viking ear Era Bathory, Blood Doom, and some stuff like Winter for a basic description. Also, um, on the new album, there's definite like early Paradise Lost Catatonia influences. So I would say it's like basically like a mix of all that um, in one big themed melting pot. Was Doom Metal the, the metal that you first started listening to when you got into the genre, or how did you kind of get into this particular style of metal? Um, Doom. Um, well, when I first started getting getting into heavier metal, it was obviously stuff like fresh and death metal. And then I was introduced to bands like Candlemas and Trouble. Um, so Doom was kind of a, a thing I got into a little bit later after I started getting into the more extreme side of um, metal. Um, I mean, obviously, I started out listening to Metallica and Iron Maiden and stuff like that. And then I progressed to heavier fresh stuff and then the death metal stuff that was coming out and then i found um candlemas um via a girlfriend who um who did me a a, a, like a c90 cassette tape with their ancient dreams on one side and then king diamond conspiracy was on the other side (laughs) and then um i came across trouble (laughs) yeah that that tape literally got played to death until it snapped in my cassette deck um and then i i got introduced to trouble via a lot like via a national rock program here in England called um, called the Power Hour. Um, and I think it was a psychotic reaction video that they showed. And, and then um, in 91, there was a Dark Passages compilation that came out on Lee Dorian's uh, Rise Above label. And that introduced me to more doom metal stuff like St. Vitus and Solitude Eternus and Revelation, Penance, Stillborn, bands like that. And then, of course, Cathedral as well with their first album. So, um, yeah, so it didn't take me too long to get into the Doom side of things. Um, you know, I was, you know, about maybe it was about 16, 17 or so at that point. Um, well, actually, no, when I first heard Candlemas, I was about 14. And when I first heard Trouble and bands like that, I was about 15, 16. So. And, you know, when you first started listening to um, metal music and, you know, as you got further into like the heavier um bands as you were saying um did you ever pay attention to the lyrics when you first started listening to that stuff yeah definitely um you know i can remember being drawn in really graphically by bands like autopsy's lyrics and dismember and um entombed and and also i was like fascinated by you know the more kind of fantastical lyrics of candle mass and solitude eternus like on their first album which kind of were telling stories pretty much um you know, um, so I definitely, yeah, I would sit in my bedroom and just 
with a vinyl or whatever and just read the lyrics as I was listening to the albums. What specifically about those lyrics like grabbed you? What, what, what about their way they use language uh, kind of was exciting? It was just the, the detail uh, to which some of these lyrics were went into, you know, like um, on the first Solitude Eternal album, for example, it's like storytelling pretty much. I always loved um, Candlemas's stories of good and evil, you know, like the battles of good and evil and stuff like, um, again, it just great storytelling, but in a in a creative writing way. But then on the flip side, you had bands like Autopsy just, you know, graphically describing deaths and mutilations and dismemberment. And that was quite also an eye-opener for someone who was like in the mid-teens at the time. Because, you know, I'd never really heard stuff like that and, and until then, you know, when I first got Autopsy, Severed Survival, for example, I was just sat there wide-eyed reading the lyrics while I was listening to the album going, wow, this is absolutely sick. And same, you know, like with this first Solitude to Turner's album, I was engrossed in the lyrical um, concepts that they were writing about, just the way Robert Law was describing basically like surroundings of where this person was and, you know, in... Um, Destiny Falls to Ruin, for example, you know, the opening line, I sat upon a grassy linen um, looking far into my thoughts. Um, and then it's like describing like hazy grayish locks and stuff like that. So you kind of just kind of get zoomed into like um, this fantastical landscape of what he's describing. I hope I got those lyrics right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it seems very right, like very detailed. Um so I was wondering, yeah. is that like uh, those themes like of good and evil, uh, the storytelling and the detail um, that's embedded in the lyrical description, are those still kind of themes that resonate with you now? Is that still what you're drawn to when you like seek out metal to listen to? Um, yeah, definitely. I, I do like uh, bands who put some effort into their lyric writing and um, in their lyrical concepts. You know, it's, um, you know, I like to... Um, I still like to sit and read lyrics um, when listening to music. And um, I do, yeah, I do always like a band that does uh, go into some depth and detail and gets very creative with their wording when it comes to um, to lyric writing and, you know, um, try and take the listener on, um, on a bit of a kind of a, I don't know, like a lyrical journey, I, you know, like through, uh, you know, through a, like, through a soundscape. When you say creative, uh, what specifically do you mean? Like, like, what is the difference between a creative lyrical journey and, I guess, like an uncreative uh, journey? I mean, like, there's some people who write lyrics who don't really put much effort into it. You know, I think, you know, um, they'll keep it very basic. And um, I like bands that kind of go more in-depth with attention to detail, maybe use some you know, some interesting words and, you know, just um, that you can see that they've really sat down and they've really kind of racked their brains and tried to come up with, like, you know, an awesome story to tell, you know, like like a fantastical tale or, or whatnot, you know. Um, like you see, you know, like with some of these um, old American power metal, heavy metal bands like Manila Road as well, you know, like, Bands like Last and um, Orman, you know, like who, uh, you know, who, who, especially on Battle Cry, there was some really like great kind of songs that would kind of really put vivid kind of um, thoughts into your head about what they were describing, you know. Are there lyrics, on the other hand, that you find common in metal that don't speak to you or that you just don't kind of enjoy? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, um, I'm not a big fan of the whole go grind stuff. Um, I find that quite soulless. I mean, autopsy, that's different, you know, like, but, uh, but um, I don't like um, a lot of these grind bands that just uh, try and go too over the top with things and like for the sake of it and it ends up becoming quite uh, cheesy, I suppose. And <laughs> um, I never really kind of got into the, the party fresh bands stuff like that, you know, like the fresh bands that I would listen to the most and still do listen to the most were bands that had more of a message um, and that had more of a, um, more of something to say, you know, like bands like um, 
sacred Reich nuclear assaults and uh, you know forbidden um, testaments, you know bands that you know that that did put effort into 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 their lyrics and um, weren't just writing about pizza parties or whatnot. <laughs> More broadly, then, I mean, do you think that you'd be able to identify like? metal lyrics from non-metal lyrics like do you think there's given that you know the variation that you just talked about in terms of you know how different bands write lyrics and how much effort they put in do you think there's still like a discernible difference between metal lyrics and non-metal lyrics um i mean you know there's some there's some metal bands that kind of almost cross over into the punk realm of things lyrically when it comes to like social political issues um so you know i think um same as some of the old brash bands, they kind of had more of a punk kind of lyrical approach, um, you know, as, as opposed to just writing about, you know, blood, fire and death and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, I think it's quite, you know, um, I, I think it's quite possible to tell the difference. Um, sometimes there's a very fine line between bands that are, a metal but have more of a, a non-metal lyrical approach and like I say it goes more into kind of um anarchistic you know punk type stuff um or more socio-political type stuff which is you know um if that makes any sense yeah absolutely yeah, sure are there some themes you think that are just really inherently difficult to explore in metal I'm not sure about what you mean by that exactly. Well, you said like uh, when something's a bit punky, right? There's like, there's like a feel or a type of lyric that's a bit more punky than metal. Are there some lyrical themes or topics that you just feel like are difficult or in, like maybe even impossible to explore in metal? It just doesn't feel like it fits within the genre? Um, I don't know. I think um, there's, there is metal bands that do have quite a unique uh, writing approach, I think, when it comes to you know, when it comes to um, they're an extreme metal band, but like say like a band like Napalm Death, they have a very definitely more of a punk, non-metal lyrical approach on their. You know, I mean, they've always had this kind of uh, anti-multi, you know, anti-multinational and very left-wing, um, you know, anti-Nazi, anti-fascist, um, t- you know, type approach. So can you tell us about when you first started writing lyrics? Uh, You know, what was your process like and what kind of lyrics did you first start writing about? Well, I was in a death metal band from 1992 until 1994 called Morstis. And I recorded two demos of this band in 1993. And um, that's when I really seriously started writing lyrics with bands. Um, It, you know, it was, it started off very much, you know, just very morbid and, kind of you know grotesque type lyric writing like uh just writing about death dying funerals um and then it kind of also progressed to some satanic kind of like all-out blasphemous um you know lyric writing you know about you know going you know there was one song i wrote in my old death metal bands um when i was second demo and uh basically about a, a guy who 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 goes back in time and um, kills Jesus Christ, uh, you know, <laughs> before he's born. Okay. Yeah, so I had a bit of a, not your typical uh, 16, 17-year-old brain, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> so has your uh, current lyric, uh, yeah, I suppose, has your lyric writing process changed over time? Like, um, do you have a different approach now to what you did back then? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, um, uh, back then I used to... Um, a lot of my lyric writing was done, you know, I would um, maybe not prepare as much as I do now. Um, I'm more thoughtful now about, you know, like, for example, when I write for on Hammer lyrics, I'll spend weeks and months refining and cutting bits out, changing bits, and just constantly refining it over a few months until it's ready to record. Whereas um, things were done a lot quicker in the old days and I look back on some of those lyrics that I wrote and, um, yeah, you know, they didn't age so well. Um, so um, I like to think I write more intelligently and 
with more thought these days than I did when I was uh, younger. Uh, that's a pretty good segue to kind of move into your lyrics uh, with Thronehammer that we wanted to talk about, uh, because you know, we've really liked reading them. And thanks for sending off the ones in the new album. Um, and one thing that kind of we were really interested in is just how the lyrics match the music itself, because we've talked to a few doom bands so far, uh, yeah. but your uh, songs are quite long, longer than anyone we've talked to. Uh, behind, behind the Wall of Frost, War, uh, excuse me, Warhorn are 17, 19 minutes long. Uh, yeah. Is there a trick to writing lyrics for songs that are so long compared to like a five or six minute song? You have to be more creative. Um... I guess, and you have, you have to think more about, there's obviously more content to think about because of the length of the song. So you, um, I do repeat, you know, I do repeat verses and I do repeat choruses, but um, I also try to make it interesting as well and take the, you know, because the songs are so long, I try to take the listener on a, on a musical journey, on a lyrical journey, you know, through, through the various soundscapes that are going on and um, and just try to make it as interesting as possible because, you know, um, I'm aware that there's plenty of people out there that like to sit and l- read the lyrics while it's, while it's listening to the album. Sure. Um, like I said before, I still do the same. And so I do try and put effort into it. And yeah, I, I, and because of the songs being so long, yeah, just, just, just try and make it as interesting as possible, not just for the listener, but also first and foremost for myself, because I'm the one who's got to sing this live and, mm. and sing video. And so obviously I want it to be interesting for myself and as well as other people. And um, yeah, it's um. I had some experience before for on Hammer of writing lyrics for long songs like in Uncoffined um, on our second album, Ceremonies of Morbidity, like every song was over 10 minutes long and like the longest song on that album was 14 and a half minutes. Um, it was like our doomed death rhyme in the ancient mariner, uh, Plague of Young Uncoffined. And um, again, you know, it just had to get creative with lyrics because you have... Um, it's not just first chorus, first chorus. There's a, especially with Thronhammer, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of changes. Um, th- there's a lot of twists and turns in each song. You know, like um, it'll go from one section to another section, to another section, and then, and then to another section. Pretty much like you know, in succession. So yeah, so it's kind of just like um, it's just trying to get creative and just keep it as interesting as possible because um, to try and keep the listener's attention because. Um, if you don't keep it interesting and creative with a song that's like the best part of 20 minutes long, it can be quite easy for the listener to get um, just to trail off and for their attention to waver, you know? Mm, Yeah. Do you know how long the songs are going to be before they come to you? Like, do you write the lyrics as the songs are being developed or do they just like, Hey, here's a, here's a 19 minute song. Best of luck. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, (laughs) They just send me the material, um, Stuart and, um, or, um, you know, that that's his uh, pseudonym. Um, so so I'll, I'll refer to him as Stuart. Um, Stuart, the guitarist, and Tim, the other guitarist, and Fran Hammer, um, especially on the last album, they both joined forces and with the songwriting. And I never know what's going to, what the end result is going to be the songwriting until they send me the files to England and then I sit down I download them I put them onto a CD I'll listen to them on my stereo start and get a feel for the songs um, but that's the first time I hear any of the material in full um, in any of the final song structures is when they send it to me so I have to um, so I don't really start writing the lyrics until um, until I get the finished songs and then Stuart will give me a basic con- lyrical concept and then he lets me loose um, with my own creativity and I put my own spin on on his initial concept and then um, and send him the lyrics um, as I go on and just, you know, t- to make sure that I'm hitting the mark of what he's, um, what he's after and, and, and what he initially uh, visualised uh, lyrically for that song. 
Right. So like how much detail does he give you in terms of like a theme? Is it just a really kind of general idea of like, um, you know, an ancient battle, for instance, or is there like a yeah. more specific story? Just a basic, uh, basic concept. And then, mm-hmm. um, and then I'll, I'll develop that concept into something more detailed. And, mm-hmm. um, and like I said, I'll put my own spin on it and, um, and it'll end up being kind of like a, a mix of his initial vision and also my kind of vision of, you know, of of that concept. Right. So um, we're looking through, obviously, your last two releases, and we noticed that, um, you know, both releases do focus pretty squarely on themes of ancient battles, war and death. Um, We were wondering, why did you decide to incorporate those themes so consistently into the lyrics of both releases? It's just a way worked out and um, it's something that we're interested in and um, I mean I'm very interested in ancient history and ancient battles and um, you know I live in a very historic area of northeast England and a very historic city as well which is the site of an ancient battle as well at uh, the Battle of Neville's Cross um, and um, and that was you know back in uh, I think 1500s or something I think that was um, and I've always been interested in, in history. So, um, so, and Stuart is also very much uh, interested in that kind of um, stuff as well. Um, you know, he's very much into the whole kind of corn and bar- like corn and the barbarian and all that kind of mm. stuff as well. Mm. So, um, you know, and I think that was like the initial kind of um, inspiration for him, you know. In, stuff like that and then um and then yeah and then um when I came on board he'd already pretty much had a concept for the songs on the first album or already um you know he he already had the song titles um when I joined for the first album and so um yeah I, I think um it's you know ancient history is um something that's all around us, you know, um, in, in, in every part of the world. And there's been ancient battles in every continent and every country. And, and I do find it fascinating, you know, uh, you know, especially like um, stuff like medieval warfare and, you know, the kind of weapon, the kind of crude weaponry used back then, you know, um, is, is, is definitely very interesting. Was there any influence from, you know, uh, the history of kind of metal bands talking about war and battle, or was it more just your personal interest in history that uh, entirely? Um, Baffery has definitely played a, 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 a big part as far as uh, being an influence on Fronhammer goals, both musically and lyrically, um, as well as my own personal interest and Stuart's own personal interest in in ancient history, ancient weaponry, and you know, historic kind of um, you know films and whatever you know. So um, so yeah. So it's kind of um, I would definitely um, you know, say like Viking era battery, like with their kind of epic kind of songs about battle as you know, in epic landscapes has definitely had a huge influence on us um on 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 both albums not just on not just on the new album but on the mm. on the first album as well which was mostly centered around um the theme of war and warfare uh, throughout the centuries so given that um i suppose stories of uh, ancient battles war and death are relatively common as we've discussed um do you ever feel like you have to kind of differentiate your work from that of you know Bathory or other similar bands that have a kind of very recognizable um you know, focus on those themes just just to basically try and put our own spin on things you know um i i think i have a certain way of lyrical writing and i i think that pretty possibly comes through on both albums i think you mm. know you'll find a lot of similar, uh, similarities in the way that I write and in the way that I structure things and the way that I word things. Mm. So I, yeah, so, so even though we do have influence, obvious influences and clear influences, I, yeah, I, I definitely think um, I struck, we put our own spin on, 
on the on the lyrical concepts and the concepts in general. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, we can definitely see, although there's like some certain similarities across uh, the two albums, uh, we did also see that in uh, Incantation Rites, um, there's some notable uh, inclusion of uh, references to ritual and the occult and Satanism that were absent from the previous release. Uh, so what made you decide to incorporate these new elements in the latest album? Yeah, Stuart um, had this concept for the title track, Incantation Rites, uh, which is basically about, you know, and... An ancient king dabbling, you know, in clandestine activities and in black magic and rituals and satanic rites and whatnot. And I kind of, uh, kind of um, injected my personal uh, interest of like Luciferian witchcraft and Luciferian Satanism into the lyrics as well to kind of give it a more you know, more of a, a realistic and sinister kind of spin, um, taking some, you know, some wording from some Luciferian text um, appears in, in the lyrics. Um, and, but again, it was his basic concept. I just, you know, picked up on, um, I just picked up his con- concept and developed it into something more uh, personal and uh, more deeper than... Um, than what he'd initially um, set set it out to be. Across the songs that we we looked at in the last two albums, like there's obviously each song is its own kind of special story, and, and they are different. But there is uh, even in in talking about you know ritual versus war, we did notice a kind of a consistent theme of being set in these you know darker, almost fantasy historical kind of settings. Uh, given that you keep coming back to this kind of I guess background kind of theme in a way is there anything you have to do to ensure that it stays fresh for you to keep revisiting not the same space but kind of a a similar space across songs um yeah i think it's just trying not to repeat um certain words too often which is quite it's not as easy as as you think actually to try and uh, to, to to try and avoid using the same words and even though you might be writing about similar subjects, um, just try and change it around a little bit, try and change the story around. Like on the new album, um, there's a song called Eternal Fraldom, which is basically about people who have been oppressed by a, a ruthless um, dictatorship, you know, a king, like a king who's very, you know, um, what's the word? Um yeah, it's just very controlling, um, and it's that song basically about people, the, the the common person, you know, rising up and uh, and rebelling and defrauding this king, um, which wasn't really um, explored on the first album. It was, that was more mm. about two different kind of armies having battles and a king kind of ascending to the you know the orphan throne and um defrauding his opponents and um you know in battle uh, so there's definitely some um differences and some different spins on on subjects that have pre- like previously been explored you know um and i'm quite confident that on the third album that we can again there'll definitely be um you know I've already had some discussions with Stuart about lyrics um, briefly at the, uh, so far. And there's definitely going to be some more battle themed lyrics on the next album. Um, but again, I'll try not to make it too repetitive and try and put a different spin on on the lyrics again, you know, and try and keep up that um, that whole thing of taking the listener on a on an interesting journey through um through various lyrical realms and musical realms. So like, do you find that kind of limiting to your space, yourself to this kind of space in a way actually can be in, like inspiring as you look for new ways to work within the the area? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I do like a challenge when it comes to creative writing. And mm. um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very open-minded to whatever Stuart throws my way uh, concept-wise. And maybe he might throw one or two curveballs out. Um, <laughs> next time um because like like on the last album for example um i think the toughest song to write actually was um of mountaintops and glacial tombs um because the basic lyrical spec was well you know it was just 
the first part of the song is kind of more describing surroundings and a certain landscape. And and then the second part of the song is when someone is trapped in a kind of like crevasse and they can't get out and, you know, they're kind of the stuck slowly dying in a kind of, you know, in, in an ice tomb pretty much. And I really had to sit down over some weeks and really rack my brains to try and make that as um, creative as po- and, in, and interesting as possible, you know, like um, to, to, to try and draw the listener in, you know, so they could imagine themselves being in this landscape and then, and then also kind of vividly be kind of drawn into the person's demise as well. Um, he, he was stuck like under the snow and the ice and they can't get out, you know, it's like, try to make it as dramatic as possible. And so when I had the first lyric, um, the first line in my head, that was it, I was away, you know, like um, I looked to the peaks that tower like spires in the sky, you know, that that was when I really had something to grasp onto. And then I just went from there. And, and then after that, it wasn't so hard. Once I started visualizing the landscape that the song was going to be based around, and then um, it made it, easy to write a whole song from there um and, and I think it's a very descriptive song and um I like to think that I managed to um to succeed in making it uh, an interesting read for the listeners absolutely um well what you've just discussed regarding you know descriptions of landscapes is another thing that we wanted to talk to you about because we noticed that uh, many of the tracks that detail battles uh you know off both albums are interspersed with songs that describe the brutality of nature uh, so, for instance, Pride of yeah. Conquered and Erased, describing a battle that takes place between two opposing sides set against the yeah. mountainside landscape. You've got the song, uh, you know, Behind the Wall of Frost, which details that deadly winter cold and frost. Uh, and yeah. then following um, Warhorn, um, a song about Call to War, you've got um, Svarta Skaya about a dark and ominous storm. Um, and to me, the, the effect almost kind of seemed as if you're creating a comparison between the death and destruction that comes from war and that that comes from nature. Is that reflective of your intent at all? Yeah, there was definitely some intent to kind of mix both together and, you know, like the site, you know, like nature and can be just as brutal as, as um, and deadly as a battle, you know, and um, can, can take away human life just as easily as a sword can. Mm. So there's definitely similarities, purposeful similarities. We just wanted to keep it really dark and grim and descriptive. And yeah, I mean, like there's a song on, um, uh, hopefully I'm not jumping too far ahead and, and yeah. um, answering your questions uh, in advance, but um, Beneath Black Cloud Masses on a new album. Again, it's, uh, it's just, you know, it, it has the, the story of the warrior, but um, also it's a very descriptive story about, a landscape that is wandering through as well. So you can mm. kind of, you know, you can kind of um, visualize the mountains and the dark skies above and the castle in the background and the, the ravens flying around in the sky and the, like the wolves howling in the distance, the fog in mist uh, that's enshrouded in the landscape, uh, landscape and the kind of tree lines that are kind of like, like this long kind of epic kind of looking forest was kind of in my head mm. you know that would just went, that just went on for miles just like you know treetops as far as the eye can see and stuff like that so then that's what I was basically kind of grasping with that song but then it also has kind of the, the kind of um it it rolls back into the whole battle thing obviously with the sword and stuff like that so when you're talking about these battles and swords and armor, kings and usurpers, war horns and banners, etc., we notice that occasionally you'll work in some kind of archaic word choices. Uh, there's word songs that use like thy or thee. Uh, there's some Latin yeah. expressions like non servium. Uh, yeah. But what is interesting is that uh, this also occurs with what we'd call, I guess, uh, pretty straightforward and direct lyrics like the ruins of a kingdom gone, forever lost eternally, an end of an era has arrived, a fragile king will now, uh, will, excuse me, a fragile king will soon now die. Uh, these are, you know, pretty straightforward vocabulary that the average English listener would understand. And on many tracks, there's a lot of uh, tendency towards single syllable words, like the first track of your new album uh, has, of the 281 words, uh, 220 are, so about 78%, one syllable long. Is there a conscious choice when you're writing lyrics to use straightforward terminology um and how does this balance with kind of the archaic terminology is is there a desire to kind of go back to the past while still being accessible 
I just generally try to um I just generally try to write lyrics that fit well and that um and that can flow well with the the vocal lines um generally. So it it's just um the way it's turned out hmm. where you say that there's um, you know, there's certain syllable uh, words in, in one song. Um it was intended to be easy to sing for me for a start so and also a certain rhyming poeticness going on as well mm-hmm. I'm very poetic with my lyrics um you'll probably notice that the last word of each line will probably is uh or possibly you know eight times out of ten rhyme with the the line two lines after that yeah that was our next question actually <laughs> <laughs> okay um so yeah so so there's so there's definitely some intense there, but in on the flip side, there's also, you know, I don't sit and go, right, I'm going to put this many syllables in this mm. uh, in these lyrics or whatever. Um, I just start writing the lyrics, um, start working on the vocal lines, start fitting the lyrics to the vocal lines and chopping bits out. And, you know, like, this is a continual process for weeks, um, you know, Sometimes I'll start writing the song and then the end result will look completely different because I've 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 discarded whole lines, whole paragraphs, and mm-hmm. put in new lines and wrote completely new paragraphs to what I originally started with. It's yeah, so it's um def- it's definitely a conscious effort to to make things flow and to make things fit with the music and the vocal lines that I've already envisioned in my head because before I really come up with the full lyrics, the full um, I used to come up with the vocal lines on my head first. Mm. And then um, I'll start, you know, thinking, right, I'll put a vocal line there, I'll put a vocal line there, I'll leave a space there for the music to breathe, and then I'll put some more lyrics here. Or, and then, or that riff can be a, like a breathing riff where there's no, you know, where, where there's no vocals and it's just it just lets the music breathe, you know. So I don't like to kind of get overly cluttered. Mm. With my, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of vocal lines on the new album, especially. Mm. So you just mentioned um, editing. Um, yeah, absolutely. It makes complete sense. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned, um, you know, that you go through this process of editing the lyrics to, you know, match these vocal patterns that you've developed. Um, I wondered, like, um, what makes you decide that, you know, a particular word has to um, be removed or has to be changed? Uh, you know, I suppose... How do you decide what makes the cut and what doesn't? It depends. Um, sometimes I'll think of words being overused. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll I'll put a different word in to make it more interesting and to also make it not, as re- not so repetitive. Or sometimes I'll just be rereading the lyrics that I've written and then I'll just automatically come up with um, a different word in my head that I think fits better and, um, and that sounds better and... And that's maybe it's a bit more cleverer than the original word that I used. And you mentioned rhyme. Uh, we obviously noticed a, a lot of rhyme in your songs, uh, such as, you know, a battle to the bitter end, a battle to the ultimate death, swords cut through the bloodied flesh, many men will take their last breath, and uh, no escape trapped under ice, a slow and painful demise seen through the frozen fearful eyes, bodies lie frozen in this ice. Uh, what draws you to the inclusion of, of rhyme as a major part of your lyrics? I've always kind of liked rhyming lyrics and kind of poems and poetic kind of writing. And, you know, I guess when I was writing essays um, back in, you know, back at school, like in English, I, I would also use like a lot of poetic rhyming. And I think, you know, like, especially when you're doing clean song vocals, I think it, you want it to flow as well as possible. You, you don't want it to sound disjointed. And I think sometimes if you have those rhyming words that kind of join up every other line then it um or sometimes even you know the line after and um, for me i think it, it makes things flow better uh vocally i don't always have the rhyming lyrics and mm. there's um there is plenty of lyrics where it's not rhyming but but um but it's definitely a it's definitely a trait that i use a lot it's definitely something that i um is a big part of my lyric writing style. So. Mm. And you've mentioned like a comparison between your lyrics and uh, poetry a few times. Is that something that you aim for when you're writing the lyrics that they'll kind of have a very poetic feel or that they can be read more or less like someone might read poetry? I wouldn't necessarily say um, I would 
you know, uh, um, I have it. The intention is for someone to read it like um, they would a poem, but um, maybe it, it makes it easier for people to to kind of follow when they're reading the, the lyrics. It's maybe, um, you know, if it's rhyming more, it kind of, it's, it'll just be like a kind of maybe it's a, a, a subconscious thing just to kind of just follow the song easier, maybe it's for some people, uh, mm -hmm. lyrically. So, but no, it's, um, I wouldn't say um, the intention is for, it's for the reader to be able to read it like a poem or such. It's just, um, I don't know, I think it's just, sometimes I like to be very direct and catchiness is something that's important to me um, in hooks as well, vocal hooks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very conscious about putting vocal hooks and catchy kind of um, vocal lines that match the music. And sometimes it's best to have, it works better that way if you have some rhyming going on. So mm. yeah. Another common trait uh, that we noticed, the one that you mentioned actually earlier in this interview, is that uh, you use a, a decent amount of repetition throughout your songs. Uh, like on Usurper of the Oaken Throne, you repeat the line, stand up and fight, rise, Usurper of the Throne, uh, eight times across the song. And Devouring yeah. Kingdoms uses the title 10 times in the word devour or devoured 15. What's kind of the goal <laughs> or the intention in regularly kind of returning to these themes and these words uh, repeatedly throughout, of course, a, a quite a long song? Sometimes it just, uh, it, it's just the way it worked out. It just seemed to fit well. Um, and... I do like to repeat verses and lines and certain words will keep making a reappearance, uh, reappearance throughout songs. And yeah, it's just, um, again, um, it's just what word I think fits best or what line I think fits best in that particular moment of the song. Um, you know, if it, you know, and again, you know, it, it might be, Try not to keep it too repetitive, but um, but but if but if it is like repeating stuff to make it sound quite intense and epic at the same time. So, does it link to that desire to be um catchy that you mentioned earlier, or is that done in a different way? Um, yeah, I guess you know, like obviously, if you were repeating certain lines, um, in certain like over like in in close succession um or certain words in close succession then it does have a certain hookiness to it mm -hmm. um and, and it'll kind of embed in people's minds pretty quickly you know and um, if you repeat in a certain line um like you know like non-servium for example is repeated a lot in eternal Freldon and um and as as is um you know the mention of the Orkin throne is mentioned quite a lot in the, the the title track of the first album um and you know so it yeah I, I, so I suppose it's just kind of um trying to draw people in and just trying to embed my lyrics um easily into people's subconscious. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. So yeah, shifting as well to a discussion of uh, the death theme that appears quite commonly in your lyrics, uh, we notice that although certainly you do describe death quite frequently across your uh, songs, um, and you do describe everything that comes with it, so including bodies, blood, uh, even relevant smells, um, but your lyrics don't seem to go into any really gory detail when describing death. Um, you know, do you actively avoid detailing gore in your songs about battles? Yeah, I mean, I. I don't want to go into kind of, um, you know, kind of go go metal, go death metal territory. You know, I I leave the graphic descriptions of bodies being ripped up and like graphically to bands like Autopsy and stuff like that. Um, but maybe it's in the future, maybe I might get a bit more graphic with how I'm describing the death of um, someone. Who knows? Um, but so far, I have consciously tried to avoid getting to. Um, you know, I don't want to get too um, death metal with my lyrics. I, I want to keep it epic with a certain amount of intelligence, um, and but also with a sinister, grisly kind of twist. And also it's kind of, um, it leaves more to the imagination as well if you're not completely describing how someone has killed. Mm. So you you, think it, it, it leaves a lot, it, it leaves a lot 
open for interpretation and and the you know the, the listener might be going oh well, well you know i wonder how that person you know my you know in in the song i wonder how they died like but because it's never fully descriptive of how an opponent and battle has been is has met their their untimely demise so do you feel like adding too much um like explicit description would actually damage that kind of uh, eerie feel that you're going for? The Quite sinister? possibly. I, yeah, I like a certain mysticism, um, uh, you know, to my lyrics. Um, I like um, to have a, you know, to have a certain... Um, so it's left open to interpretation and, and it's, you know, it, it, it has a certain, um, yeah, just so it's not completely wide open and it leaves possibly more for members of part two of that concept, you know. Mm. I do like to have a certain mythical kind of vibe going on, a certain mysterious vibe in places as well, uh, as, as well as creating, you know, the eerie kind of uh, sinister kind of atmosphere that um that is prevalent in some songs yeah absolutely so um yeah we also wanted to ask about um although that uh, many of the songs off usepa are written in the third person the songs uh you know conquered and erased and thrown hammer feature i um and there are actually more songs from incantation rights that include uh first person perspectives uh you know with uh, beneath black cloud masses uh, of mountaintops and glacial tombs, and a fading king featuring I or my, and uh, you know eternal thraldom and thy blood um, even take we. Uh, I was wondering why did you think um, you wrote more songs off incantation rites from the first person perspective? And um, it's just the way it turned out. It's just um, it it suited the concept of the songs better that I would write in. Um, more of a first person way or um or even using more we as well uh words you know like um you know like we come slayer um and it's, it's it's that kind of the army kind of uh that kind of brotherhood kind of you know that, that brotherhood in battle kind of feeling mm-hmm. and um but then also the first person um concept yeah, it just fitted certain songs better than writing from a second person perspective. Um, or, you know, and it's just the way it turned out. Um, I haven't really thought too much about that actually until you brought that up, but it's very interesting that you did. Some parts were definitely in more of a group situation. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and there's a lot of, you know, we so obviously it's about a group of people rebelling against a tyrant not just one person rebelling against a tyrant and then also the same in um in in thy blood as well um again it's a it's about a group of people that are in battle not just one like not just one to one person combat mm. so Whereas, um, I mean, Kisepra, the Orkin From was definitely more of a first person um, song, I think, because um, obviously that song is basically about, mainly about two rivals fighting. Mm. And just one person being defrauded and one person being victorious. So, Does I ever represent yourself in any way in any of these songs, or does all, is it always some character that you're kind of singing from the perspective of? Yeah, I just try and put myself into the kind of into the place of a character um, in these songs. Um, you know, I, I try and write it from a like you know from a fantastical kind of character point of view, mm. and um, yeah, and and kind of you know um, try to write basically from that first person perspective of how they visualize and being. So it, it's always definitely a character character involved um you know when it comes to first person writing it's it's d- d- there's always a, a certain person in mind you know be it be it um, a warrior or be the you know um a king or you know or in a, in, a, in a lot of cases a warrior king so mm. Mm. yeah so there's um 
so yeah so I, I i have these little characters in my head when i'm writing the lyrics and uh yeah i kind of try and visualize what they would look like and um you know um and then also obviously there's we 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 have um our kind of little version of Eddie now, which is a uh, Kingslayer, which is uh, on the front mm. cover of the new one. And um, so yeah, so so he'll be um, he'll be making a reappearance um, in future lyrics and on possibly on maybe even on the future on the on the next album. Uh, but who knows? Um, but uh, he'll definitely be featured in future in a future summer too. So awesome. What about when yeah. um? When you refer to to you on albums, because we noticed uh, on on the first album, Reserve of the yeah. Spoken Throne, there's only one song, Throne Hammer, that references a you. Uh, when you say you'll run and you will hide, you'll cower in fear of your life, you'll bow down to my thunderous might, you will kneel and, be- kneel and beg for your life. But on Incantation Rites, uh, five of the seven songs involve a you. Uh, is this you also just like a fantastical character that appears in the story, or are yeah. you ever singing about an individual or a group that you have in mind when you when you say you? Just, uh, you know, definitely more from a fantastical point of view, uh, be it a rival and battle, you know, like um, like the Fraunhammer lyrics for the song Fraunhammer is definitely very much about, um, yeah, you know, uh, I am just like, you know, put myself into this uh, fantastical character kind of mode where I'm, you know, making people afraid of me and bowing down to my... Uh, yeah, to my um, power and my, you know, uh, and so yeah, it's always definitely a, a fantastical character themed thing, you know. Um, so rivals and battle, or you know, enemies and um, you know, yeah. So it's, yeah, definitely just try and visualize other kind of characters as well. So mm. and um, I mean, like when I like first start writing the chorus to. For the song for Hammer, um, I had a, I scrapped a, a bunch of different attempts at it because I was like, oh, this might sound a bit too cheesy or this might not work out very well. Um, but then once I had the, you know, what you see on the final results, I was like, oh, you know, it was a, a good kind of um, battle anthem, I think. So. So does this does writing this kind of lyrics and putting yourself kind of into these stories uh, is is it a, in a way like uh, a method of kind of exploring these experiences or these identities or, or even placing yourself in these kind of fantastical situations? Is there is there a personal connection to these kind of stories as you tell them and I guess sing them over and over and over again on stage? I mean, obviously, when you're on stage, you go into a different kind of mindset and a different zone anyway to to your regular self. Um, so yeah, but, um, I do get drawn into my lyrics, and I do, you know, you know, this definitely um, like the song Fraun Hammer, for example. It's yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely like a rouse and kind of anthem live. It's turned out to be, and um, so you get you get yourself into a certain mindset that you wouldn't usually kind of get yourself into because um, you kind of just get up you know, really engrossed in what you're singing about. And so, yeah, so, so there's a lot of kind of fist pumping and, you know, uh, arm throwing and, you know, stuff like that. You know, maybe it's one day I'm like, I saw it, you know. So, but, you know <laughs> that would be awesome. Too, and that might be the two kind of war or, um, or, or, or Mass and Walkie from Sabbath, possibly. So um, uh, people have already done that, but I don't know. I mean, um, if you go, there again, I'd probably... Uh, Injure myself if I uh, if I started throwing a sword about on stage. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, but you know, like, um, yeah. So you do get into a certain mindset, and you know, when I'm singing these each line, you know, I'm really getting myself absorbed in the lyrical concept, and it's just kind of, yeah, just being kind of uh, possessed by different. Um, characters and songs I suppose and, um, and just, just really kind of you know and um, trying to obviously um, get away from you know your daily kind of um, mindset you know I think when you're on stage you have to kind of 
going to a different zone mentally and and going to a different persona to 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 put across the lyrics and the songs um how how they should be put across i'm definitely not very feminine on stage put it this way like um, <laughs> I, I i i shout a lot and um and yeah there's, there's, there's definitely no um it's uh, when i'm on stage it kind of you know the whole gender thing just goes out the window you know um there's there's, there's no there's no gender rules when i'm on stage there's no, not really any gender rules anyway. I, you know, I'm, I'm quite, um, you know, I'm quite, you know, I don't necessarily follow specific things, but um, yeah, I guess as a trans person, you can be quite anarchic in ways um, when it comes to, to, to that. But um, well, definitely on stage, to, you know, yeah, all kind of gender rules just go out the window. You know, I don't care if I sound manly or not you know when I'm shouting and singing you know I don't you know that doesn't bother me because um, I'm just trying to put across um, lyrics in a certain way and, and they've got to in the, in the, in the, in the, be put across you know pretty harshly in, in places and with a lot of um, you know um, you know I've never had voice surgeries um, on my voice so um, so I can still go really deep um, when I'm singing and um so so yeah so it's 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 quite interesting to throw curveballs out to people because you know um you, you know on stage where you just go into a completely different persona and mindset and um you're completely different to how you are off stage so does exploring these stories especially live then in a way serve as a sort of a space of, of liberation of throwing rules out the window of of uh engaging in in you know places that i guess don't exist elsewhere yeah you know i guess it's um you know it's just you know uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so of just pure escapism mm. that, that you know it's it's going into a different world going into a different mindset uh just detaching yourself from any mundane things or stresses of daily life you know you just put all that behind you for like an hour or so on stage and you just become a different person and just go off into these little fantastical realms of um of of, of battles and storytelling mm. it's interesting what you're talking about regarding uh, you know the escapism that you can experience through metal it's certainly something that we've heard about before and you know several metal musicians we've spoken to have talked about how they use um you know metal as a way to escape their daily grind and things like that uh, but they've yeah. also talked about um you know the difficulties involving um you know writing lyrics that can describe anything personal um and especially anything that could be considered political and this is something that you kind of mentioned earlier in the interview as well um, and what I found interesting about Throne Hammer is uh, that although your lyrics don't appear to be, you know, overtly personal or political, and, you know, as you've said, they certainly serve as a vehicle to escape the kind of mundane reality that we might kind of live on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, Throne Hammer yeah. has still taken a very kind of clear stance against, um, you know, fascism and racism uh, in your posts on social media and through the creation of merch, like, you know, the patches that say Throne Hammer against fascism. I was wondering, yeah. do you find it easier to address issues like fascism in the metal scene outside of the lyrical context? I think for us, um, you know, it's uh, it works better that way. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to get political with my lyrics. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather keep them fantastical and definitely more from a, a kind of a creative storytelling point of view as, as opposed to... Um, use my lyrics and prone hammer as a platform against anti-fascism mm -hmm. we can do that we can do that more constructively and more effectively as we do uh, via social media posts and via um like merch like the front hammer against fascism patches i mean like um you have to remember that um the rest of the band are based in most of the band are based in the nuremberg area which mm. and, and that's that's where we're based and and that was a stronghold for the nazis in world war ii and also, my grandfather fought against the Nazis in World War Two. Um, mm. So both those guys over there, and, and 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 both myself, you know, we're very, you know, because of our connections to to World War Two, be it ge like geographically or, or be it due to family members fighting um, in in World War Two, 
um, or, or even the First World War with my great grandfather. Um, for example, um, it's yeah, it's you know, it's important to make a stand. I think, um, you know, um, I think especially in this day and age when there's a lot of um, a, there's a lot of people who are emboldened by right wing views and racism and. I think it's very important to take a, a strong direct stance against um, such rhetoric and such um, such bullshit um, that um, is definitely um, seem to become a lot more prevalent in in the past half half a decade. I would say, mm. you know, I mean, especially with stuff like Brexit over here in England. Um, that really emboldened a lot of right-wing people and a lot of racists. And there's been a rise of fascism in Germany o- over recent years as well. They have um, this political party that's um, springing up um, over there, the um, AFD, which is um, a right-wing party full of, you know, full of basically full of um, national socialists and racists and um, xenophobes and... Um, I, I think in this day and age, you know, even though your lyrics might not be based around um, concepts of, of uh, socio-political subjects, it's, um, it doesn't mean that you still can't be vocally um, speaking out against um, day-to-day um, socio-political topics. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's lost us some fans along the way, but they're but but, but they're not the kind of fans that we want, you know. Um, but it's also again, there's a lot of fans as well who are. Uh, who are who are all who agree with the the staunch anti-fascist um, and the anti you know the anti-conservative right wing kind of um, bullshit that's um, that's so prevalent not just in America but also England but also in Germany as well. That actually links really well to um, our final question, which is uh, given that you you have this kind of split between the themes you want to explore in your lyrics and, and the meaning those lyrics have for you and then the themes that you explore as a band you know or promote as a band in your merch etc um what broadly speaking would you say the fundamental role of lyrics within throne hammer's art is and i guess even more broadly what do you feel is the fundamental role of lyrics within metal as an art form lyrics it, it differs from band to band, uh, but in general, you know, it's a it's a form of a you know it can be a, a form of escapism, a form of storytelling, but also making some very strong points as well. Um, it depends what you're writing about, I suppose. Um, you know, so some bands use their lyrical platform in more of a, a realistic way, um, you know, where they where they're writing more about you know reality mm. as opposed to fantasy you know be it all the way from bands like sacred reich to bands like napalm death and even gore fest you know um on their second album they definitely had some um very left-wing um lyrics um going on um you know that were definitely against um right-wing ideals and um conservative thinking but then you know, so, so on one side you have the bands that have the that use their lyrical platforms in more of a direct reality way, but then you have other bands that just want to use their lyrical platform to to take you off into a land of pure escapism and storytelling and um, complete fantasy. And then you have some bands who mix both together. So, so is is metal? Do you find it a, a space where there's a lot of freedom and in, in sort of what you want to do with the the space that lyrics provide you? Yeah, I think the metal scene is generally. Um, it's very diverse, um, so you can definitely get very creative with lyric writing, and um, there's a huge blank canvas to explore. Pretty much, you know, so many different topics and so many different um, ways of lyric writing, and ways of putting either your views and visions across. You know, I think it's probably the, there's so much variation in metal lyrics and. Um, you know, even in one genre, I mean, within the Doom genre, you have quite a lot going on in j- just in one genre, and that's not even taken into account. All the other subgenres and genres of metal that you have out there that, you know, and it's obviously some of the lyrical themes cross over, but, um, but I think it's, um, for, for a lyrical writer, I think it's um, definitely one of the most creative things to be involved in, I think, definitely. So Wonderful. just finally, where can fans go to learn more about uh Thronehammer and your upcoming projects and any future releases. 
Um, yeah, we have um, obviously our Facebook um, social media platform, um, you know, um, which is very active. Um, you know, uh, there's a few of us that will post up um, posts there. Um, also, um, Supreme Chaos Records is the label that's handling the vinyl and the box set of our new album. So, um, they're also very, um, you know, um, active. You know, we also have Instagram as well, but, you know, it's pretty much the same concept. Uh, you know, the same content as what we post on Facebook. Um, and then we have our Bandcamp page as well, where people can buy stuff, um, the Fraunham, uh, Fraunhammer Bandcamp. Um, I'm not sure of, of the exact address, but if you type in Fraunhammer Bandcamp on Google, it should come straight up. Um, and there's also links to that on on Facebook as well. And um, so, yeah, so we're quite easy to access on social media, um, you know, uh, Instagram and Facebook. And um, yeah, just uh, thanks again, uh, Jess and Wes. So it's been it's been fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All Bye. right, take care. Bye. You too. Thank you for listening to Lingua Italica. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you stay tuned for our next episode. Before we leave, we just wanted to acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging.